Can I welcome everyone to the 30th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices on to silent for the duration of the meeting? First item of business is a decision on whether to take agendas item three and four in private, and to also consider whether to take all future reviews of evidence on education reforms in private. Is everyone content that agenda items three and four are taken in private and all future reviews of evidence on education reforms be taken in private? Yes, thank you very much. Next item of business is our first evidence session as part of the early scrutiny of the Scottish Government's proposed education reforms and legislation. The committee is keen to explore the evidence base for the reforms and today we'll hear from a panel of educationalists. Can I welcome Keir Bloomer, convener of the Royal Society of Edinburgh Education Committee, Dr Tracy Burns, Senior Analyst, OECD, Professor Ch Ch Chris Chapman, Chair of Education Policy and Practice, Glasgow University, and Professor Graham Donaldson. I should mention that Keir is also the Chair of the Commission on School Reform, and thank you all for coming along today. Before I invite questions from other members, I'll start with a general question on your views on the proposed reforms. To what extent do the proposed reforms reflect best practice internationally? and how applicable is the experience of other countries and education systems to the Scottish context? Would anybody like to begin the answering? Okay. It's going to be a short meeting today. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, <coughs> Professor. Uh, say a few words uh, initially on the reforms. Um, I mean, my perception of the, of the overall package is that the uh, if you take each of the elements individually, um, you, can, you can see, you can trace a, a relationship between what's proposed, where Scotland has been, it's learned from past experience, and it's also obviously drawing on uh, experience uh, elsewhere. So um, within the total reform package, the antecedents of the reform and the evidence base of the reform are quite clearly uh, traceable. Um, my own view is that within that total package, um, the challenge will be um, uh, not so much as to whether or not the, the nature of the structural changes are, are, are right or wrong. It will all hinge on the extent to which uh, the nature of the relationships that, that exist between all the various uh, stakeholders within the process uh, are strong, constructive and positive, and whether we get the leadership right uh, in relation to both uh, what happens at the national level, at the, the new regional collaboratives, and particularly at head teacher level, because the head teacher's charter places a huge... Um, uh, responsibility on our heads uh, across Scotland and one of the, the tests of this will be the extent to which uh, our head teachers rise to that challenge and also the extent to which we're able to have procedures in place that make sure that where the problem lies at the school with the head teacher rather than elsewhere that we have mechanisms that identify that well in advance rather than being reactive to a problem that's emerged. Thank you very much. Mr. Book. The Royal Society of Edinburgh felt that the government failed to make the argument in favour of the reforms as strongly as it might have done, either in the original consultation or in the next steps document, which came at the end of the consultation. Now, that is not to say that there aren't very good arguments in favour. They just weren't made out in these documents as convincingly as I think it would have been helpful if they had been. Uh, we feel that there is considerable evidence that internationally there is a trend in the direction of decentralisation of governance of education systems, although the evidence is not tremendously strong that that is beneficial. There is some evidence, and I think Tracy is able to speak to this much better than I am, uh, that of a connection between decentralisation, uh, devolving control to schools and improvement in standards, but it is not a particularly uh, strong correlation. So, uh, like Graham, I feel that much will depend on the quality of the relationships that subsequently get uh, established and the quality of the leadership that is offered. Professor Chapman, Dr Bonzo. Yeah, um, just really to amplify the points around relationships and to highlight um, the fact that, is, that the direction of travel, I think, is... Um, sound and, and based on evidence, um, but there isn't a switch that you can flick. I mean, if we if we look um, south of the border, for example, you can 
trace back um, these types of reforms really to the 1988 Education Reform Act uh, and local management of schools. And there has been an incremental um, devolution or, or empowerment of head teachers over a period of decades. So, um, you know, I, the, the point that I want to amplify is that this is about relationships and ensuring that we have the right leadership in the right places at the, at the right times. Thank you very much. Dr. Burns, do you have any you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, just a couple of points. I think one of the things that um, resonated with me was that all of the issues that are on the table are really the hardest issues to solve. I mean, these are the hardest governance challenges that, that we see with all the countries we work with. I mean, it's absolutely in line with, with the issues that, that we see all of our partners and all of our, our countries struggling with. So there are no easy answers, as Chris just said, but I, I do think it's important to point out that the question is not so much, you know, should it be decentralization or not? It's more of a question of what should be decentralized and what should not be. It's not, it's not just a process of giving away everything to a local level. So it's, it's really about the details and making the process work. Okay, I'm sure we're going to come into uh, more detail with some of these Liz, would you like to start the question? Convener, um, I have to say, I think this is one of the, the most challenging, but also the most interesting uh, questions that we face. Um, the evidence that we've uh, received from the OECD and also the evidence that we've had uh, through internal uh, parliament <coughs> briefings seems to suggest, uh, and I think you said it, Dr Burns, in your uh, report, that it shouldn't be about structures, it should be about the process and ensuring that what we adopt is what works. And from the international evidence, it seems to suggest that there are a, a variety of systems that work well. In that spirit, could I ask you whether you think that that in itself is a learning lesson for Scotland, that there maybe isn't one single model that is appropriate? And my second question would be, to what extent do you think that as well as a head teacher leadership and the relationships, is accountability the, the key word when we are deciding what should and shouldn't be reformed? Um, I think, I mean, in our work, accountability is really at the heart of modern governance challenges and getting that right. Um, the three themes that we focused on were accountability, capacity building, and strategic thinking. And those came out of discussions with our 35 member countries. They were consistently the issues that were the hardest to get right. Um, I think in terms of takeaway points and what is a learning lesson, I think the, that there is no one right system is, is absolutely right. And the reason that there is no one right <coughs> system is because it's, it's having the right structure is helpful, but it's, it's not sufficient. And so really being able to plan and create a system that works and that is continuing to be able to adapt and meet the, the needs of, it, of, its, of its people is actually, is actually the goal. So even if at the end of today or at the end of this reform there is a perfect system that's developed, it will never succeed in, you know, in permanence to keep doing what it needs to do. It's, it's about creating a system that can evolve and change as the problems evolve and change. And I do think that that's a fundamental thing to note because the temptation is usually to focus on the structures in the hope that it's a relatively quick fix and it's, it's concrete. So it's, you know, you feel successful when you can do something, but it doesn't mean that it's going to change any of the relationships underlying it. And that, that was the point my colleagues were making at the beginning. It's those relationships which are key. Uh, Professor um, Burns, could I just ask, tease that out just a little bit? I think that's an interesting answer that you've just given. If, if it is correct that um, we, we have to be uh, flexible uh, on a very complex issue, but also to take different lessons from other countries, do you believe that we need to do much more to improve the data set that we have in terms of educational performance? Or do you believe that we can move forward simply by looking at the lines of accountability? I'm going to hedge this answer, um, mostly because I'm not an expert on Scotland, so I don't feel capable of answering precisely about the data set you do have. What I would like to iterate, though, is that, and this is a sort of a theme and a trend for all of the OECD countries, that simply having more data available does not mean that it's used. 
And one of the things about, about compiling and, and marshalling evidence to make decisions is that that can also be a contested space. So, you know, it, it, people can be very rational also in the use of evidence, and they can also choose the evidence that suits their purposes. So being able to, to sort of have a lot of evidence and a lot of data doesn't necessarily answer the questions. It's, it's really creating a system that is designed to provide the evidence that you need to answer the questions that, that you have. So that, I know that's a hedge, but I, I think it's actually a really important point because one of the temptations in many systems has been to, to just provide more and more data in the, in the belief that that will sort of make things transparent and clear. But if the data isn't used or it's not used appropriately, then, then it's actually not necessarily helpful to do that. Kier Bloomer, could I ask you to comment on that? Because I know the Royal Society has got quite strong views about... Uh, the paucity of data in terms of making judgments about Scotland's performance? Yes. Um, we do feel that the quality of evidence that is available in Scotland is insufficient. Um, I think I'd like to comment also, if I may, on the first question that you asked, which was about the place of structural change. Um, Scotland has not actually gone in for much change in governance for a very long time. Um, and I think there is a tendency in Scotland to underestimate the importance of governance change and structural change. Um, there are a lot of things which are very strong in the Scottish education system. We have a very well qualified and highly skilled teaching profession. There are a lot of policies in place which I believe to be right, like Curriculum for Excellence, uh, like the report which Graham Donaldson was responsible for on um, professional development of teachers. And yet, uh, the results that Scotland has been obtaining over the, the past couple of decades have not been particularly impressive. So there is, there is something which means that we are not getting the maximum benefit from the strengths that our system actually possesses. And I think that has to come down to the governance structures that are in place. There has been no really serious attempt to address governance in Scottish education that I am aware of since the Education Act of 1929. So we couldn't really be accused of constant fiddling with the structure. Um, and while I don't think that uh, governance change in itself brings improvement, it does put in place some of the prerequisites for improvement. Or to stand that on its head, if there are problems in the way that the system is run, then unless those are addressed, uh, we will not make very much progress, whatever the strength of our, our policies happen to be. Now, I do agree about the importance of evidence in support of those, which is why the Royal Society, as I said earlier, regretted the fact that the argument in <coughs> favour of what is now being called a school and teacher-led system was not more strongly advanced in the, in the two papers. There is problem also, of course, at the more local level about schools having the data available uh, in order to enable them to make sound judgments. Now, I think that situation is improving, but there is still a considerable distance to go. Thank you. Uh, Daniel and then Tavish. I think it's fair to say that, that uh, everyone across the Scottish Parliament has used the 2015 OECD paper uh, to, to sort of slightly suit their own purposes. I, I think it's an incredibly useful bit of work, but I was just wanting to explore, I think, two of the key themes there. I mean, one was that it talked about needing to strengthen the middle. And the other one was that it was, you know, essentially that there was a watershed moment for curriculum for excellence. So just in terms of that first point, and maybe, and I know Tracy Burns wasn't the author of that report, but you are from the OECD, so I, I, I might slightly put you on the spot. How would you characterise that requirement to strengthen the middle? And, and maybe I think, and I'm you know, building maybe your previous answers about the, the, the relationships, what, what do we need to do to make sure that that middle is, is strong and, and, and focused on improving Education in Scotland. I was not the author of that report. Um, my colleague David Istins was one of the main authors, and he um, he had a, a lot of passion for for the work that he put into that report, and he felt very uh, positive about about both the Scottish system and and the recommendations the review made. Um, in the context of the general governance discussion about the role of a middle tier, more broadly. Um, what we find is the importance of 
Um, this comes from a lot of work with the Nordic countries, for example, where power was devolved to the muni municipal level. So in some countries that could be a municipality of 120 people um, and the, they have the same governance uh, responsibilities as the city of Oslo or the city of Stockholm, for example. Um, that didn't work particularly well and doesn't and doesn't work particularly well, and they struggle a lot with particularly reinforcing the capacities of the smaller players to be able to deliver on their mandate. Um, so one of the things is trying to think about whether it's a series of networks that work together that, that sort of help each other and build capacity for some of the smaller players, or whether it's a, a formal middle tier in a structural sense, which is designed to not only build capacity and, and uh, help the different players and help learning between the different partners, but also to think about more broad, broadly equity issues. Um, because one of the dangers is with, with full devolution is that you have uh, very small players who, who lack the capacity to deliver, but also who have less resources available to them. And so they, have, they are less able to deliver even if they had the capacity. So the role of that middle layer, whether it's a formal structural body or whether it's a series of networks of players is both to build capacity and support but all and to keep the conversation going among all the players to sort of allow them to learn from each other but also to ensure equity across the system to really make sure that national objectives and excellence is being met by and can be met by all of the devolved bodies and all of the devolved pieces of the system. I think that answer is very interesting. And clearly, the, the, the issue at stake here is about capacity uh, at, at that middle there. I was just wondering if you or other members of the panel felt there was sufficient clarity on that. I mean, if I can just, you know, to summarise, what we're looking at at the moment with the, 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 this review is we will have Scottish Government level, there'll be an Education Council, there'll be regional improvement collaboratives, there'll still be a role for local authorities, there's school clusters, and then there's school. That's potentially six different layers of, of competence and layers of, of locus. I, I, I'm just wondering whether or not we are actually potentially creating kind of more complexity rather than reducing it and whether the, the, there's, there's over focus on uh, structures rather than that capacity. And I, I'd be interested for, on any thoughts on that from the panel. Yeah, I, I uh, thought that um the use of the term middle in the OECD report was unfortunate because I think it's led to uh, a kind of discussion of what we mean by the middle rather than focusing on what, they, uh, what we actually need to, to do. So I, I, and I think what, what was meant by the middle was it shouldn't be top down or bottom up. Um, uh, and therefore middle was a kind, I think, a kind of, of way of saying we need collaboration. What you need to do is to create a, a way of, of, of bringing about change in a system uh, by which it's not no no one bit of the system is is in you know is the one that's responsible for it, but it needs a collaborative structure. And, and talking about the middle is is where all of that can come together. So I think the the middle, uh, my own view is that we shouldn't necessarily think of the middle as a back to the structural question as a tier, which is where you tend to go to straight away, but you actually think about the mechanisms by which you can ensure that the that uh, all of those who have a, a, a direct role in ensuring high quality education have the uh, opportunity and the duty to collaborate in order to make that happen. So I, 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 I think that notion of collaboration is, is, is an important um, part of the process. Um, and I think the creation of the, the notion of, of the regional collaboratives, uh, therefore, are not really a tier in the system. They're a mechanism by which you encourage collaboration. So to that extent, I don't think it necessarily should be seen as an additional tier in, 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 uh, in, structural, in a structural sense. Um, uh, I don't know whether you want me to talk about the watershed moment, but I, I could certainly talk about that. Do you want to? Oh, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. If you'd like to talk about the watershed <laughs> moment, please feel free. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I, 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 there I would agree with the, with the OECD report. I do think uh, we, we are at a watershed moment in terms of curriculum for excellence. I, I think Scotland has suffered from being one of the, if not the first country in the field in terms of thinking about the curriculum differently from the way it had been thought about previously. Um, uh, Chris made reference to the um, 1980 Act in, in uh, England and Wales, uh, which essentially was a coverage curriculum. What it did 
uh, and, and sensibly so, said at that, that point there was, an, there was a problem of entitlement in terms of young people were not getting the entitlement to the broad and balanced education which they were entitled to, and therefore it defined the curriculum tightly at the centre uh, and set it out in, in, a, in a range of, of um, subjects and programmes of, of study. And that was, that was by and large, about, about entitlement. Uh, over time, uh, that has led to uh, a, a very inflexible and uh, uh, highly uh, uh, crowded curriculum where the, as pressures build up, it tends to get added into, uh, uh, into the curriculum. We never had the same um, um, statutory uh, national curriculum in Scotland, but the same kind of pressures applied and the same um, um, evolution to a certain extent, I think, took place in Scotland as it did in, in England. Um, Scotland, in, the, in that early period, um, uh, with, the, uh, with the creation of the Parliament and the, and the, the uh, long, hard look at what we were trying to do with school education, the, the national debate that took place at that time, um, came up with quite a different way of thinking about the curriculum. That was that we need to think about young people's experience at school uh, as being, of course, about the learning in relation to the, to the subjects, but it's about more than that. Uh, and it's about the extent to which young people themselves are shaped as individuals and people through their experience at school. And the four capacities of Curriculum for Excellence were an attempt to give expression to what, what kind of young people are going to come out of the school system ready to not just cope, but to thrive in the, in the, in the world they are going to live in you know, into the next century. So Scotland was one of the first countries in the field to think about, to start thinking about the curriculum differently from, from a kind of a coverage curriculum. Uh, I think over time, uh, we've lost the narrative. I think over time, um, we, we no longer know what curriculum for excellence actually and its fundamentals are. And therefore what we have are a series of bits of curriculum reform and we need to re, uh, uh, re recreate and, and, and uh, um, re-emphasise the narrative because that original thinking is of vital importance. Uh, we don't know. Um, deciding what young people do at school is incredibly complex uh, given the uncertainties of the, of the future world and therefore building them as people is as important if not more important than acquisition of lots of learning. So can I, can I just ask if other members of the panel would, would agree with that supposition that essentially that we need to have a sort of a a regroup and, 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 and sort of uh, think about the direction of curriculum for excellence, consolidating what we've, we, we've done. And I, and I wonder whether or not people would, I mean, one of my thoughts is whether or not this governance review is actually a, a distraction from that bit of work, or at the very least, not focused enough on, on that sort of central theme that I think that we need to focus on. I'm just wondering if... I would agree very much with the analysis that you've just been offered. Uh, by Graham, uh, both the questions you asked, the one about the middle and the one about the watershed moment, have in common uh, the problems that we are having with Education Scotland and the need to do something radically to improve that organisation. We will have in place very shortly a new Chief Inspector and I wish her well in tackling the many problems that she's going to face. One of them certainly is that Although the government accepted the recommendations of the 2015 OECD report, and that involved, of course, uh, a radical simplification, or should have involved a radical simplification of uh, curriculum, for curriculum for Excellence and the mass of guidance that had been, has been produced, I do not think that that process has gone far enough, and I don't think that it has yielded the result of real clarity in relation to what the objectives of Curriculum for Excellence actually are and the key features that have to be emphasised in order to realise those objectives, which I think is very much what, uh, uh, what, what Graham is saying. So we need to do much more to take forward the thinking that was in the OECD report in relation to uh, Curriculum for Excellence. I also interpreted uh, the meaning of the middle in much the same way as, as he did not simply as the intermediate tier between schools and central government, but as being much more about collaborations, networks, the whole infrastructure that uh, lies in the middle that enables and supports teachers uh, in doing their job. The government has clearly decided that uh, the correct way forward for this uh, is regional improvement collaboratives. 
Now, at the time of the original governance consultation, the Royal Society of Edinburgh did not agree with that, and I don't think very many other people did either. Um, it was not a suggestion that found much resonance with any of the respondents. In the interim, of course, there has been discussion between government, COSLA, ADES, and so forth, which has resulted in a new, and I do think superior model, of uh, regional improvement collaboratives. I have, I have one serious objection to the way in which that was done, because it seems to me that the difference between the conversations that government is free to have at any time with any stakeholder and an open public consultation is that the open public consultation gives those who are not generally spoken to the opportunity to have their voices heard. In this case, they will not do so because, of course, the future shape of the collaboratives is now determined. It has been determined between lead stakeholders and the notion that it is being consulted upon at the moment is frankly farcical. Nevertheless, I do welcome the way in which the concept has changed uh, over the ensuing months, but I think whether the, the notion of a collaborative structure of that kind will function effectively depends very much on the future functioning of Education Scotland and even more than that upon the notion, which, a point which is made incidentally twice uh, in the consultation on the bill, that the performance of the collaboratives will be led by schools and by teachers. They will be organisations that respond to what uh, schools actually want in the way of support. Now, if that is realised in practice, that will be a very substantial step forward because the major failing of Education Scotland, Learning and Teaching Scotland and the two predecessors before that was that they were seen, and indeed were, instruments of government policy, not instruments of providing the support that the profession thought that it actually wanted. Just going to let Tavish in now, uh, and I think you want to continue in Education Scotland, but we've got another hour here, so can I ask that we keep our answers a bit shorter so that we can get through all the stuff that we have to get through, Tavish? Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to pursue Keir Bloomer's line of argument with the other panel members because um, Education Scotland have been responsible for the last 10 years in broad terms, and uh, yet the proposals, as far as I can understand them, augment the powers of Education Scotland. Do you, does the rest of the panel believe that's the right approach? The original decision to um, bring together um, Learning and Teaching Scotland and the uh, Inspectorate of Education um, was an attempt, I believe, to try to ensure that uh, the learning that came out of the inspection process was more directly fed into the way in which development was, took place um, nationally. And I think that was a very laudable um, uh, aim. Uh, as some members of the committee may be aware, prior to that, I was head of the inspectorate, so uh, uh, I'm not exactly um, uh, uh, totally objective in relation to all of this. It would not have been my preference to bring the two bodies together at that time, That's not what I would have done. And what I had done with, what I was trying to do with the inspectorate was to move the inspectorate to a much stronger focus on improvement. So we were using accountability as an agent, an, an agent of improvement. And the inspectorate did a lot of work in terms of leadership and, and so on, uh, arising out of the work that it, that it did. That's now water under the bridge. Um, uh, the decision was taken, the two bodies were brought together. I think the challenge now facing uh, uh, Education Scotland is to um, convincingly create the appropriate uh, Chinese walls inside the organisation that preserve the independence of uh, inspection, so that inspection is not simply seen uh, as the enforcement arm of, of the development side of the uh, organisation, which is sometimes how it's, how it's characterised, but can genuinely provide uh, evidence uh, uh, to, the, to the system more generally, uh, to, to all of us who are engaged, have the good of scholarship education at heart, can provide independent evidence that allows us to make uh, judgments about how well things are progressing. Uh, which have, have, are sufficiently independent to have credibility in relation to those judgments. I don't think that's impossible within the, the, the notion of an education Scotland. I don't think it's what happened in the period immediately prior to this. And how you could possibly be both the Chief Inspector of Schools and also the Chief Executive of Education Scotland, and how you could possibly have a Chinese wall between the two roles that you hold as an individual. 
Well, I, I think that's one of the one of the, the governance issues that the director of inspection within Education Scotland, I think, needs to have uh, a, a degree of their own uh, integrity and independence within that structure, which is then fed into the the chief inspector. Uh, but that is transparent, so it's not doesn't happen in, in, in a way that's, that's simply a, a, a behind closed doors. And I think if that process happens, there's an expectation that the the, the results of inspection, not, not simply uh, school inspections, but the more thematic work that uh, uh, the inspectorate does uh, has transparency in terms of how it goes about its business. I think that, given that you have a, a combined structure, I don't think it's impossible to create something that would be um, would satisfy the requirements of independence, but that will not be easy, and, and, and part of it will be about perception. Uh, it's not so much necessarily whether you can do it or not, it's whether people perceive that it's working well. And that will be a real challenge for the, for the new Chief Inspector. Thank you, I think so fair. Dr Burns, I wonder if I could ask you internationally, just on this point of, that uh, Professor Donaldson's making about the, the split between inspection on one hand and, and policy on the other, in terms of what we're discussing. What is your international um, experience? Presumably there are both models in, in good education systems around the world? Uh, there are actually, and there's. An, I, I mean, I think the the real takeaway is to have a conversation, and perhaps you've already had this about what what the goals of the system are in terms of outcomes. So a, a lot of this discussion is predicated on, you know, m increasing outcomes or improving the system. And one basic question is, what does that mean? And so. Um, it, the inspector, its job is to think about the functioning of schools, and I think part of that is to have a, a discussion and a, and a serious thought about what elements of, of performance are they actually interested in uh, tracking and, and interested in actually um, monitoring, because I, I think that's really fundamental to what we think of in terms of what we want out of an education system. Down in the current proposals that the government have presented? In this case, I, I actually don't know enough about the, the current proposal. Um, what I would say is the model of success, can it can be successful both ways, but I think it is really important to get the mixture right. So I, the way Graham has spelled it out, I would, I would actually agree with it. It's incredibly important to, to balance that correctly. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Richard, you wanted to come in briefly and then that's all over. Well, <coughs> I don't know if it's in this theme, but I just want to ask a sort of general question, listening to what's been said so far. Clearly, as you perhaps expect with any debate over governance, there's a very academic flavour to your contributions to this committee. Uh, and I just want to bring it back to real life impact in the classroom and ask you in terms of the debate over governance and some of the themes we've been discussing so far, what is your view briefly on what the actual impact will be on teachers and the classroom environment given that one of the big themes of Scottish education is teacher workload. And whilst we debate legislation in this place and we'll do our best to make sure it's the best legislation possible, ultimately we have to think about the impact in the classroom. So what's your response to that? This point takes us back to the OECD report. Um, and I'd just like to start off by um, sort of reiterate, reiterating the, the call for more evidence in the system. Um, I think it's um, laudable that we are drawing on um, a vast international evidence base, um, but it was clear in the OECD report um, that there was a call for um, a stronger Scottish empirical evidence base and um, a, a stronger involvement of our universities um, in developing that. Um, I think that we've made some progress since 2015. We have a research strategy. Um, we have the um, newly formed Scottish Council of Deans of Education who have been working collaboratively um, with government um, in drawing up proposals um, to um, take forward a programme of research. And I think that will be key um, if we are to understand um, the complexity and the nuances of the realities of teachers' lives in their classrooms. So um, I don't think we should um, take the realities of practice um, in a sort of detached, isolated way away from creating and developing um, a robust Scottish evidence base. So that's the first point, and it does come back to the OECD report. Um, the, the second point, I just wanted to pick up on the, the strengthening um, of the middle. Um, I concur with co colleagues around, around the table, but I think this sort of also plays into the Education Scotland debate in, in, in a way, because it's really about um, balancing accountability mechanisms and, and improvement. And I think historically what systems have had around the world is sort of, uh, a relatively sort of bureaucratic set 
um, of organizations in a, set within a hierarchical cultures. And what we're trying to do is break down those vertical bureaucracies and create much, long, much more um, or strengthen those lateral ties and networks. And that has implications for accountability. If, uh, and you know, I, I would like us to be using the word responsibility more than accountability in, 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 the, in the debate. You know, professionals being responsible to one another for their performance rather than accountable to somebody somewhere for, for, for their performance. Um, I think that if we can use the, the regional improvement collaboratives um, as um, a mechanism and a set of arrangements and processes that support the movement of our staff around the system so they gain different experiences and different insights into how the system works, we have a much um, more uh, realistic chance of these reforms being successful. Um, because they will have insights and will have built the capacity through a different set of experiences um, compared to traditional career progressions. So for me, it's about creating more flexibility in the system and seeing the regional improvement collaboratives as something that's much more fluid um, rather than another set of bureaucratic arrangements that sit within the middle in, 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 a, in a hierarchy somewhere. Um, the, the final point um, that the I think the OECD brought up in 2015, which was really important, was about well, links in, and it was about moving from a centrally managed system and placing innovation much closer to the classroom. And, and for me, um, this is about um, empowering schools um, and head teachers and teachers to be able to make um, decisions um, at, at the learning level. Um, but in order to do that successfully, we need to create a culture where the, we, we're not so scared of failure and that people are encouraged to take risks. And that's very well, and the system will improve as long as we um, combine that with monitoring the impact of those changes to practice that teachers are making in classrooms. So we know what is working and improving practice and what isn't, rather than doing it on a whim and a hearsay. Well, it was really just to say, just, if I was a teacher and I was quite you know, busy in my classroom and wanting a rest at the end of the day, and I was watching this debate, I'd be thinking, what does this mean for my everyday job? So the governance changes you support. Is there any examples you can give me of what that will mean to the everyday experience of a teacher in the classroom? Yeah. I mean, ha having been a teacher in one of those classrooms in, 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 in a very challenging school, I, I, I can um, tell you absolutely what it means for practice. It, it means actually placing students at the front of, of, of everything you do rather than being caught up in some of the peripheral activity. Um, it means um, not only placing students at the forefront of what you do, it means working with and learning from your, your colleagues um, in other classrooms around the school, in other schools locally, and, then, and, 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 and also beyond. Um, this cannot be a bolt-on. Um, this has to be a fundamental rethinking of the way that we work um, and the way that we view um, our professional lives and, 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 and our contribution. If it does end up as a bolt-on, then th th there's a danger that... Um, we are just adding without taking away um, to, to the complexity of teachers' lives. What, what we, as I said, what we need is for teachers to be um, understanding how they can um, have the most impact on the lives of their children by working with colleagues um, and taking responsibility for the outcomes of children, not just within their classroom or their school, but also in neighbouring schools around the system. So we have this sense of collective responsibility, um, which I think is key for us moving forward. Okay. Oh, sorry, Professor Thomas. Just to pick up, because I, I have a lot of sympathy with the, with the, uh, the uh, import of your question, because I think it's important uh, that we look from the classroom up rather than look from the, the outside in, in terms of the, of the reform. And I think from a from the point of view of a teacher, you know, a, a kind of a classic response would be it depends um, whether this will make a big difference to, to, the, to, to the capacity of the teacher to do the kind of job they want to do with their young people. I think if we do move to a situation, as, as Chris has described, where um, more space is created for teachers to work together uh, in relation to um, uh, uh, arriving at approaches to learning and teaching that are going to really make a difference for their kids, I think if the teachers are supported more in terms of their own professional learning, uh, uh, Kieran made reference to the Teaching Scotland's Future report, I think that's still work in progress. We still have quite a long way to go to actually create the framework within which we've got a teaching profession that is properly supported in terms of, of, of growing uh, as a profession. 
But the, the most significant bit is we, we need to get the accountability mechanism right because the, the risk, and, and uh, Tracy, I think, will recognise this internationally, the risk is that you, you create um, a structure within which the rhetoric is about freedom, the rhetoric is about greater um, uh, ownership of the system, mm -hmm. but the reality is you're free to do what the accountability system tells you to do. So you're not actually free at all, you're simply responding uh, to the, the pressures that come from the accountability system. So I think getting, being very clear about how we establish a constructive approach to accountability that reinforces the good things that are happening in our schools and, and affirms those good things that are happening in our schools and works with the profession in order to bring about improvement, as well as identifying those relatively small number of occasions where things are not going well. Workload becomes an issue. Uh, when you don't believe in what you're doing, when you believe what you're doing is, is, is because you simply have to feed the machine. Um, and a lot of, I think, teachers' complaints about workload is because they feel a sense of alienation from what it is they're being asked to do and the way in which the accountability system is impacting on them. So the, so the, the, the way in which we will um, get a much more vibrant uh, classroom experience for young people is to be very clear about the relationship between backing the profession and getting the accountability mechanism constructive rather than, than uh, one which is, is uh, intrusive. Okay, thank you. I, I'm, I'm going to move on. You can come back in later. Uh, Oliver, and then Ross. Thank you, uh, convener. It's sort of pretty much picking up on all of the points we've heard already. I'm, I'm interested to sort of go back to the issue around relationships uh, because I, I, I get the sense from teachers I speak to that there, there is a breakdown in trust in the system already. Uh, there's a number of people who haven't bought into the Curriculum for Excellence reform uh, or, or certainly have very serious questions uh, about it. We hear the issue around teacher workload, um, <clears throat> lack of meaningful consultation uh, on some of the new uh, proposed reforms. I just wonder you know, wh wh when you know, a major partner in the reform process feels like that, how it's ever going to be possible to, to build a shared sense of ownership over this round of reforms? I, I'm not sure I agree with you in terms of, of uh, teachers' views about Curriculum for Excellence. Uh, over the course of the last uh, uh, two or three months, I've, I've, I've done quite a lot of work with groups of teachers across Scotland. Um, and one of the questions, head teachers and, and teachers across Scotland, one of the questions that uh, I ask at the outset is whether they still believe in Curriculum for Excellence. Um, and given the opportunity to, to discuss that and then to vote on it. Uh, and overwhelmingly, the belief is still there in, that Curriculum for Excellence is the right thing for Scottish school children and for Scottish education. But the follow-up question is, do you know what Curriculum for Excellence actually is? Uh, and what comes across there is more confusion about uh, what we're actually talking about. So going back to the response to the earlier question, I don't think mm -hmm. Curriculum for Excellence uh, which becomes a kind of label is the is the problem. I think it's 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 uh, recapturing the huge enthusiasm that was around across Scottish teachers um, about ten years ago for for what Curriculum for Excellence was trying to do. We need to recapture that um, and re-energise the profession and support of Curriculum for Excellence. I think there's huge goodwill still there towards it um, if we get that right. Yes, sorry, Mr. Bonner. In my view, there is no lack of consultation. What there is is a lack of evidence of consultation making any difference. And uh, I think the profession and everybody else becomes steadily disillusioned by circumstances in which a proposal is put forward, is severely criticised, and yet goes forward in a virtually un 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 unaltered form. So I think uh, I don't exactly agree with your form of words, but I suspect I agree with the... Uh, intent behind them, there is in that sense uh, something of a breakdown of trust. Teachers do indeed still believe in Curriculum for Excellence, but they lack clarity about what Curriculum for Excellence entails. And there has been, I think, a very significant shift in the way in which government portrays its priorities, um, because we hear very little now about Curriculum for Excellence, we hear a lot about the National Improvement Framework, and particularly we hear a lot about the first two priorities in the National Improvement Framework, which are raising standards for all and closing the gap. Now, there is nothing incompatible between those two priorities on the one hand and implementation of Curriculum for Excellence as originally conceived 
on the other, but I think that link is not being made sufficiently strongly at the present moment. And if, if, if the government still adheres to the original philosophy of curriculum for excellence, I think it needs to re-emphasise that that is the way forward and the way in which the two main priorities of the National Improvement Framework can be realised. Okay, thank you, Oliver. Uh, Ross, and would you like to also go on to your next question? Yeah, no bother. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, this very much, uh, first question follows on very much from uh, Richard Lockhead's line of questioning. I'm still not convinced that the government have got their priorities right here. Um, I welcome that education seems to be the flagship domestic policy issue for them. I question uh, why <coughs> governance reforms are their priority, looking at the evidence of where the issues are in Scottish education. Governance is, is far from perfect. Um, but to me, it does not seem as if the evidence leads you uh, to the conclusion that, for example, regional uh, bodies should be one of our top priorities. Uh, Professor Chapman mentioned, for example, um, the desire for teachers to collaborate more and how that improves education outcomes. Absolutely. If you look at the responses to the consultation, the responses from teachers were quite overwhelmingly clear when they said that their barrier to uh, greater collaboration is not a structural barrier. It's resources, it's the result of budget cuts, it's the result of a decade of austerity. So my question would be, is governance reform the right priority when we have not resolved what seems to be what the workforce are saying is a far greater issue, the financial and budgetary constraints as a result of the last 10 years? Anybody like to take that one on? I don't, I don't think that's an either or. You know, I don't think that's it's either governance or finance. I think it's it's. Uh, I mean, obviously, we've lived through a period uh, where uh, uh, the the increasingly the public pound has to be spent very parsimoniously, and we've really not been in a situation where where in the past we've probably been more able to 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 lubricate change uh, through um, through resources, and that's much more difficult in the world that we're we're currently living in. Um, therefore, um, uh, one of the ways in which you can you, you can get more um, uh, get more out of the resource you've got, I think, is is through collaboration. I think it's that ability of of, of teachers to work together. Uh, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So you actually get more from that. So it's one way of addressing some of the difficulties that are around. I do think that does lead to decisions having to be taken about how we create the space. Uh, within schools in order for teachers to engage in that kind of, of uh, collaboration. I think there are, that's, that's part of the decisions taken by head teachers. It may lead to some quite hard decisions about, uh, uh, for example, class sizes or, or, or the nature of, of uh, choice in the curriculum because both of those impact uh, on uh, the, the extent of time that, that uh, teachers are, are um, in front of classes. And I think it's important that we don't define productivity in teaching as being the amount of time that teachers spent in front of a class. Uh, I think the productivity is, is to do with the quality of what happens when teachers are in front of a class and we haven't invested nearly enough in terms of helping uh, teachers to be able to do as good a job as possible. We've seen simply having them uh, um, fulfilling their contractual requirements as they currently exist as being the, the, the measure of, of, of how we're using the resource well. I think we need to be prepared to take some harder decisions uh, about how we create that space. That, if there's more money, that would be great, but if there isn't, then we have to think about different ways in which we can do that. Yeah, just to sort of follow up on that a little bit, I think uh, one, of the, one of the principles of, of thinking about governance is really trying to understand the whole system and taking a whole system up approach. And one of the reasons why that's really important is to avoid a sort of bit-by-bit -bit way of dealing with, and it was talking about the curriculum earlier, that Graham's observation that you end up with a lot of pieces, but the, the whole thing doesn't necessarily hold together. And I think this part of the process and actually having a vision for the system is really crucial to be able to have all the pieces aligned. Because if you focus on one piece and you don't align it to the rest of the system, then that piece may improve for a particular moment in time, but it's not going to necessarily have long-standing change. So in terms of building the momentum and the sort of critical mass for change, there does actually need to be a real step back to think of how all these pieces connect. And one, it hasn't come up yet, but one of the things that, that I thought was quite interesting is, is sort of this uh, way of thinking about teacher pathways and, and different roles and specialities for teachers and thinking about that as a way to sort of ret retain, and retain the best and, 
attract highly motivated teachers to the profession, that's absolutely in line with international evidence, but it's also connected to all the accountability frameworks and all the potential for collaboration and expertise. So, so all of those people, all of those pieces actually need to fit together. So I, I would argue quite strongly that it's not a, a distraction at all. It's a necessary precondition for having a system that works. Uh, Professor Chapman, you wanted to come. Yeah, um, I think we've spoken a lot about collaboration, and collaboration doesn't happen by accident. Um, that there has to be an architecture in place to, to support the collaboration. And for me, the fundamental issue is about how you lead and build the leadership capacity in order to make that collaboration um, effective and purposeful. Um, we see that if you look at the research evidence that um, in terms of impact on student outcomes, the leadership practice um, that gives twice the effect size of, of, of any other practice is the investment in professional learning. Um, therefore, we must be investing in our teachers and our leaders' professional learning um, to a level that we've never invested before. Um, and that goes back to the point about building different pathways and having a coherent pipeline of both teacher development and leadership development within the system. And, you know, again, I think we are, we are at um, a really important moment when we could put the pieces of the jigsaw in the right places through the governance review and the associated set of reforms. But the key, of course, will be in implementation. Okay, how, the, how these things play out in practice um, remain to be seen. But the, as I said, I think the direction of travel is the right one. It's based in evidence, um, but it requires us having the strongest possible leadership in the right places at the right time. I'm sure everyone in the room would like to see Scottish education better resourced than it is at the present moment, but I do not see that as the most significant um, problem that we are facing. Actually, in all circumstances, what you do with the money is more important than the amount of the money that you've got. Uh, Scottish school education suffers from excessive bureaucracy, unhelpful over-accountability, recurrent workload problems, um, inadequate policy implementation. These are all, at base, governance problems. We have got to get the governance uh, infrastructure right. Um, had I had the chance to answer Richard Lockhead's question, I would have said very briefly that getting decisions taken nearer to where they have their impact has got to be a good thing. And it has the potential to reduce workload if we have less permission seeking and reporting back. I say it has the potential to do that. It's not inevitable that that will be the effect because we may be lacking in courage in letting go of the system when we devolve decision-making. But I think the direction of travel is right and I think that the emphasis on governance is right too. Do I have time for one follow-up on this convener? Would you like me to move on to the next? Could you move on to the next yeah, one? No I'm, I'm um, about worried about time, Ross. Thank you. Appreciate it, thanks. Um, and just, uh, Dr Burns, one of the uh, areas where there's been a, a lot of focus and a lot of emphasis from the government is on greater parental uh, involvement in the system. But an area that I'm interested in is greater involvement from the children and young people themselves. And I was wondering um, if you had any examples from elsewhere where greater pupil involvement in co-design of the curriculum, in governance, in school-level governance, and on whether it is municipal or, or greater levels, where that has helped improve not just outcomes, but buy-in from those who are being educated. This is uh, something that I'll give you an example from Flanders because this is actually something they're really currently working on right now. Um, they have a real, uh, because of the structure of their system, they have a highly uh, inter in iterative process for policy making and a highly participatory process. Um, and they struggle a little bit with getting that right, but one of the things that they've really tried to do is build the voice of the students and the voice of the parents. I think it's very clear, well, from their perspective and also from, um, from research evidence, it's very clear that being able to be part of the process increases your feeling of responsibility and ownership if your voice is heard. Being part of the process, but then as sort of a, an exercise where you just tick a box, has the opposite effect. So I think it's, it's a very positive way forward, but it has to be done well to navigate this balance between hearing the voices of the people around the table, but sometimes you also need to take very difficult decisions, and not everybody's going to be in agreement with that decision. And so I think one of the 
things to get right is, is to be very clear about who's involved, why they're involved, but also at the end of the day, who is responsible for making really tough choices. And it might be that that group of people might change depending on the circumstance, but it needs to be very clear. Because the one thing that is clear from the Flem Flemish experience is that if you involve students, but it, it can be, if it's perceived by the students as an empty exercise, then it backfires. And just as a, a brief general follow-up to that, what then does greater pupil participation look like under the current direction of travel uh, for reform in Scotland? What does that? Uh, what what would greater pupil participation be? That operates at uh, at different levels. I think we already have quite a number of examples of of uh, pupil engagement uh, in in partly um, how they're learning and, and also what they're learning in different schools in, inside Scotland. So there are examples, and certainly uh, um, I'm currently doing um, some work down in Wales, and there are uh, examples down there that I'm seeing of, of uh, young people's in, engagement. Actually, I'm working with the Children's Commissioner down there to try and increase the level of, of young people's engagement in the process. But I think also um, we have here in Scotland uh, a number of mechanisms by which young people at the, at the local and national level uh, can have a voice, uh, and I, my own view would be that, that, that the, the, uh, the need is for us to use the existing structures more to engage young people directly in the, in the, in the process. It, it, they're the ones that are going to affect at the end of the day, and I do think we've, we've, we've been remiss in the past in not engaging more directly with young people. I think we have the mechanisms to do it, we just need to use them better. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Yes. I think there are some um, examples of you know, excellent practice that are occurring in Scotland. Um, the part of the challenge that we have is capturing those in a systematic way, which goes back to my previous point about research evidence. You know, we should be investing in case studies of this type of practice so that um, we can inform other parts of the, the system and move, move this you know, excellent practice around. Okay, very briefly, Julian. Yeah, um, some of the best schools that I, in my area that I go to are ones that involve pupils in the learning of younger pupils, particularly the ones that have the partnerships with senior school pupils going into primary schools and assisting with the learning there. Do you think there's a scope in what we're doing here to actually take that and, and, and widen that out better? I think there's some schools may be nervous of doing that, and in fact it's very good for the development of the pupils both at younger stage and the, the senior stage. A really um, interesting example of an evidence-based practice where cross-age tutoring um, is, uh, uh, um, does Im improve outcomes in, in both the tutor and, and, and the mentee, and there's quite a, um, a, a long history and tradition of working in that way. So that's exactly the sort of practice that I think that we should be celebrating, documenting, and, and um, moving around, around the system, abs abs absolutely. Yeah. Um. <coughs> Thanks very much. I suppose one of the questions that I'm interested in is this argument around school autonomy, and I would uh, hold my hands up as somebody who's a school teacher for 20 years. You can see what the challenges in that would be, but what seems to happen is there's an interchangeability between school autonomy and head teachers' autonomy, and I wonder if there is a difference between that. I suppose I worry that if we have an education model that's based on a, the Mr Chip's view of a teacher, that you have somebody who's very charismatic. There are excellent examples of head teachers who have done that in Glasgow simply by the sheer force of their personality and putting structures in place around that have changed schools. But as someone who wasn't Mr Chips, I understood that to be a good teacher is about getting systems in place that work. So I wonder, how do we, how do we protect the system um, at a school level if what we're doing is basically handing over authority to the head teacher and therefore at the mercy of that person's view of the world. Um, and I suppose that the, the, there's a related question. I wondered how do you, you talked earlier about pupil entitlement. There is a question about already schools gatekeeping. So um, parents with a child with a disability. Over many years, campaign groups have fought for the right to have mainstream education and sports in place, or for youngsters not simply to be moved out of the system when they're causing problems. What, should, what would be the protections at a local level um, on that regard, if at the same time you're saying, well, it's all about the school and it's all about the head teacher? I think um, I, I, I um, absolutely 
uh, agree with the, the thrust of, 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 uh, of the question that you're, you're asking. Uh, and I do think uh, this does come back to uh, the way in which we invest in uh, ensuring what we've got is, a, is, a, is a, an approach to leadership in our head teachers, um, which is not uh, governed by pleasing external forces, but actually by trying to create uh, the conditions inside a school that make a, make a school successful. I think uh, Scottish College of Educational Leadership uh, has been doing some very good work uh, uh, on, on a much broader view of leadership than, than has been the traditional case of, of uh, thinking about a head teacher. I think the whole focus on teacher leadership uh, and on distributive leadership, seeing a school as a community, which is not simply uh, operating at the, at the will of, of the person at the top, uh, but in exactly the same way as we're moving away from a, a, a top-down or, or a, a, a approach to um, uh, at, a, at a national level, I think within schools we need to develop the same kind of uh, collaborative and participative culture in terms of shaping the nature of what happens inside a school. And we have a, a lot of evidence emerging about teacher leadership, about the role of distributive leadership, about the ways in which uh, head teachers uh, can create the architecture that allows um, the kind of, of, of uh, uh, initiative to take place at classroom level. So we don't simply create a new top. Instead of the top being outside the school, the top's the head and everything just has to flow from what the head does. So I, th I, I, I think that will be one of the, one of the uh, important aspects of making the, the, the new system work. Uh, a head teacher's charter is, is a charter for head teachers to be, be good at the process of creating the right kind of schools that allow our, young, our teachers to, to do a good job. And that's, a, that's uh, an important development in leadership. And we have lots of evidence um, and, and good practice in Scotland about that happening. And you've made reference that I've been to schools in Glasgow where you already see that, that happening. But what do you do if the school view is that we're not going to offer we're going to restrict the curriculum. We're not going to offer the same number of subjects you might get at a high school down the road. You're going to actively have a, a system, which a discipline system, which sh moves children out of the school. That and it works. The school community agrees with that. They think that's the right thing to do, but it's not necessarily right for the individuals within it. So, what protect? I mean, are we arguing, for example, I think as one of the papers mentions, a board of governors, a, a governance and accountability? at a school level, because what, I think what troubles me is we've got a contradiction in policy, which is we're devolving to the schools, but we're centralising out from local authorities. And ultimately, is it, there's a danger, either that you can't, you've given them, let it go completely, as Keir Bloomer suggests, and therefore there has to be accountability at that level, or you're weakening the capacity at a local level to influence or shape what's been done at a national level or to be a ballast against it. I wonder what are the protections that need to get put in place? Right, Mr Bloomer, do you want to comment on that and then? Uh, part of your question was what do you do if a head teacher restricts the curriculum? Another version of that question would be what do you do if the local authority restricts the curriculum as a whole number of local authorities did in relation to the number of uh, examinable subjects that young people could do in S4? And the answer to the question is absolutely nothing. Nobody did anything about it, and the curriculum was restricted as a result. This is certainly a problem that could exist uh, at, at school level, and the answer to it lies very much in the, in the quality of leadership and in cultivating the leadership skills that are necessary uh, to run schools in the, in the kind of way that uh, we would want to see them run. <coughs> Schools are complex organisations and they, they are systems and they have to be dealt with as systems. Um, dealing with complexity, dealing with unintended consequences is all part of the apparatus you need in order to lead that kind of complex organisation. There is quite a lot in, in Tracy's paper that, that deals with this particular subject. I think we have made a lot of progress in relation to head teacher development in recent years. What we have to be careful about is that it is genuinely leadership development and not followership development, which actually in the past it often has been. It's about how you as a head teacher can more effectively implement policies devised out with the school uh, on your behalf. 
I think we have moved beyond that now. I think the kind of things that Graham was saying was uh, are absolutely right. I'm sorry that um, the S Scottish College for Educational Leadership, having done uh, a very good job, is now simply to be absorbed into uh, an education Scotland which is as yet unreformed. It seems to me a pity that it was not allowed to continue with the, uh, with the good work that it was doing, but it was certainly taking us in the direction of cultivating the kind of school leadership that would be required in order to operate schools effectively in a more autonomous setting. The other question I would have in return is that we seem to be failing to recruit head teachers now. I mean, the local school in my area now has a head teacher who's responsible for two secondary schools, maybe more than that, at some point. So I think th there's a contradiction between us, presumably defining this role better and recognising its role and its people's response to it, which has been either not to apply or not to at the level that, that, that is expected, I'm not sure. And I, I, on the question of restricting the curriculum um, at a local authority level, I mean, I agreed with that as well. I mean, I think I'm not quite sure how we go with that. I do think that goes back to resources. I think schools and local authorities have made choices around these questions as a, as a consequence of resources. The two things, um, I don't think, are in contradiction to each other. I suppose my last question to you is, will the system, can the system only work effectively with a reasonable amount of resource? And we've had this question already. It can't really work in a system where you've not got enough people in the the school to deliver it, for example, or the enough support round about the school um, for it to be delivered. Presented, Professor. The resource, I mean, I mean clearly that, that, uh, that's critical. There is a minimum level of resource that's required in order for a school to work well. I think um, some of the evidence, and Tracy might want to comment on this, some of the evidence from the OECD work is that there isn't a correlation between how well how much a country spends on its education and the quality of that education that is how you use it i think chris said that earlier um, and i do think uh, we the, the risk is that what we do is simply um, maintain our existing practices and then try to somehow or other work in um, the new ones and i do think it leads to some quite we have to think some quite hard about some of the decisions that need to be taken in order to ensure that we really are uh, creating the kind of high quality uh, learning that uh, that young people um, need and deserve line of questioning which is that you the panel this morning made much rightly of, of effectively continuous professional development for teachers and and um, the importance of, of I suppose learning in leadership um, many teachers many heads in my part of the world and indeed across Scotland teach they, they are uh, I can think of primary schools and you haven't mentioned the difference between primaries and secondaries although it's in the RSC paper but th there are plenty of primary school teachers in my part of rural part of Scotland where they are four days a week in class when are they going to find time to do all these other things? Or maybe I should put that question in a rather better way, which is, will these proposals be adaptable to allow that to happen? Because otherwise, I can see how you can teach the head teacher of Anderson High School, who's got a thousand kids, give her more time to, for the, the things you're describing. I'm not so sure about the Cunningsborough Primary School when she teaches four days a week. The importance of context, and that I think any set of reforms um, have to be presented in terms of sort of frameworks and principles so that, that there is local um, responsiveness and, and, and adaptability so that they can be interpreted and implemented um, within, a, you know, a, whether it be a, a rural context of a small primary school or a large urban, urban sec secondary school. You know, I, I think we're not um, arguing for a, a one-size-fits-all model of educational reform here. I think we're arguing for something that is very nuanced and adaptive. Um, to, to, to local contacts. So I, I, I sort of agree with your mm. statement. Thanks. Sorry, Sorry. on you go. Not on you go, Mr. Vellum, and then Dr. Bunzel can then after you. Uh, you raise a very important issue which the Royal Society of Edinburgh is indeed concerned about, as you say, and that is the very differing management capacities of secondary schools and primary schools. I mean, I have observed over many years that policy making in Scottish education is very often dictated by what secondary schools desire and primary schools find themselves as a kind of afterthought. Not enough consideration has yet been given as to how primary schools will be enabled to take on the kind of responsibilities that uh, the government wishes them, I think rightly, to, to take on. Um, there is no reason in principle, of course, why 
uh, primary schools should not enjoy the same kind of delegated powers as, as secondary schools can, but there is a need to build capacity. Our view is that the best way of doing that is, is probably through clusters. There are no doubt other possibilities, but before this becomes legislation, it's important that that particular issue gets the consideration it deserves. Dr. Collins. Yeah, I wanted to, to sort of follow up, actually. I'm hearing a lot of the same things, but there's some very clear evidence of sort of the danger of, of taking the wrong path, if you will. So I think both Chile and Sweden give very clear examples of what happens if you devolve too quickly and too suddenly without providing the support that's needed at the local level. So this is partially on an individual context level, but it's really also about equity in the system. And this is a fundamental element that needs to be got right. And, and it, it's actually I incredibly important to get that right because we have, we have many examples of what happens when you don't get it right. Um, the other thing is on funding, and actually just to, to share with you that there is um, there is uh, work that's just been released in the most recent education at a glance at the OECD that looks at the functioning of the system. Um, Graham is quite, quite right that there is a correlation to the amount spent and performance, but only up to a certain threshold of which all the OECD countries are passed. And once you're past that threshold, it's not it, there's no real correlation between the amount spent and the actual outcome. So it's it's how you actually choose to spend it in that in that space. And there's uh, a new uh, piece of work that's just been released, which could be interesting to look at that looks at different systems and the trade-offs they've made. So some systems choose to save money by having bigger classes, for example, Japan, Korea. Others choose <coughs> to focus more on, on spending money to support teachers, but then they have less, uh, less uh, time spent outside of the classroom. So those are some of the traditional policy trade-offs, which we actually have mapped along with performance as measured by PISA. So that, that could be helpful to consider in, in the future as well. Very much for what was. The previous witnesses to the committee, uh, Frank Lennon, experienced uh, former head teacher, uh, he made the point very strongly that um, increasing autonomy for head teachers should not be an end in itself. It's a means to take decisions and to pick up the point that Keir Bloomer uh, raised earlier. It's about putting the decision closer to where it matters. Could I ask you, uh, Professor Donaldson, in this context, what would you like to see in the head teacher's charter to ensure that that leadership um, is, is top class, but also gives the head teachers who are going to have to take these auton or more autonomous decisions uh, the confidence and the accountability in order to move forward. Yes, I, I mean, I think there's two, two dimensions and it partly uh, uh, goes back to what uh, the, the concern that Joanne Lamont was, was raising. Um, I, I do think we talked earlier about um, whether or not we've got the the, the the story right in terms of what it is we're trying to, to, to achieve in Scottish education, the strategic direction right. And I think one of the, one of the corollaries to the head teacher's charter is to be very clear about what the strategic expectations are of a school. And that could relate to um, issues to do with, with the breadth of the curriculum. I mean, that could be something that is taken, is, is a duty that's laid on a school at, an, at a national level without prescribing in detail the specifics of how that uh, should operate. Beyond that, the, the, you can then use the inspection process to engage with the, with the schools as to way in which that duty is being taken forward in that, in that school. So I think there's something about strategic direction um, where we need to think more clearly, I think, about the context within which head teacher autonomy is going to be set. So it's not a thousand flowers blooming, do what you like. It operates within some very clear expectations about the nature of, of, of uh, what it is that's expected. I, I, in that sense, though, we, we, uh, and that then relates to the kind of, of accountability structures that we put in place that allow us to engage with how well head teachers are um, discharging the, the duties that are, are laid on them through national legislation and, and, and working together. What we need to be careful about, I think, is that, that we, what we don't do is put in place uh, a very um, uh, rigid accountability structure, uh, which then becomes... Uh, the way in which head teacher behaviour is then driven by accountability instead of being driven by what happens inside the school. So I think the, the bit in the middle in terms of, uh, is absolutely right. I think it's, it's a real frustration, I think, for a head that the kind of things that they would like to do, the decisions they would like to take in order to create a better context for learning, they find it very hard to take at the moment. So I absolutely agree with the principle of the head teacher's charter. I think we've, it's got to be buttressed at either end with 
clearer strategic direction about the duties that that goes with that, responsibility that goes with that, and an accountability system that engages with that in a constructive way that relates to those duties. Uh, thank you very much. My fi final point is, is exactly what Frank Lennon said to us, actually. Um, just, just to go a wee bit further on that, do you fear that if we accept that greater um, autonomy and therefore slightly different lines of accountability within different schools and different local authorities, do you fear that that might be uh, a system that's uh, too diverse? Uh, there's, there's, there's a risk that, that um, uh, if we don't get this right, that what you get is a very atomised education system that is, is too diverse. That's not inevitable. I think that just does, does depend on the way in which we take it forward. But I think the benefit of giving head teachers more scope to be able to, to uh, shape the nature of the school that they work in, as I say, when we talk about head teachers, I'm talking about the school community which the heads are orchestrating, more, more shape. I think... Uh, that has the best chance of, of, of creating the kind of context where youngsters will get a higher quality education than they are currently getting. Um, but I do think it needs to be buttressed at either end. Thank you. Um, I'm very interested in international comparisons and uh, particularly, uh, um, Ms Burns, around where other countries have done something that's maybe been proposed in our governance review, particularly around um, regional collaborations and partnerships and cluster work. I'd, I'd like to ask you wh what examples you might have where this has been successful, why it's been successful, what they've done to make it successful, because I think we're at the start of this where we really need to look elsewhere to see uh, good practice and adopt it. Um, I can give you two examples. Uh, one, I would say, uh, they, and I would, uh, I'll preface this by saying it, they're examples of success, in my opinion, but when you talk to the countries, they can be quite self-critical about whether or not they've achieved their goals. But So from my opinion, Norway has done a very good job of um, thinking and instituting processes, so it's not, uh, to go back to our discussion about a middle tier, it's not a structural thing, it's actually a series of partnerships peer learning networks that work together on a collaborative way to try and really um, provide the kinds of support and the kinds of guidance that would be needed by locally autonomous schools and heads of schools. So that is an example for me of a very positive way for, in this case, a national government just simply giving the empowerment and the support that's needed and being responsive to the requests from the field for the time and place and, and manner of that support and just sort of giving the tools over to these constantly evolving networks and partnerships and it, there's a lot of peer learning that goes on. And so that for me is a really promising example of using a lot of the processes to further this kind of, pro of debate and this kind of devolution of responsibilities. Uh, another example I would say comes from a more structural approach which is um, currently underway in Chile which is really trying to, they are formally establishing regional um, regional bodies to uh, to administrate the work they had they had full devolution and they are actually now re-centralizing in some ways um, and they are actually creating um, regional I think six or eleven at the last count regional bodies which have formal administrative power to help guide and govern the systems that are still. Um, there's a lot of devolved power, but some of the um, equity issues and some of the making sure that outcomes are met are actually now respons responsibilities of that of that middle level. So that's an example of a structural solution, and then there's the example of the more process-driven solution. And I think both of them work well. And and the guiding goal and the challenge for both of them is ensuring equity across the system, because the the real danger if with this sort of let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, approach is that you have those who do well will continue to do well and continue to excel and those that fall behind the danger is that they will fall even further behind because they, they simply don't have the support they need to deliver on, on what they're expected to do. Preempted in my next line of questioning around it, how do we ensure equity across all schools involved in a regional partnership? You know, obviously some schools have got different challenges by the very nature of maybe the, the area that they serve. How do we ensure that we have that equity across across all schools. Just, I can just give you a couple. So, I mean, this is the crucial question that the most evolved systems are struggling with here. I'd say the Netherlands and Flanders in particular. Um, 
the need, and in some cases there is a, a discussion about re-centralizing some aspects, but I don't know, that, I wouldn't say that it's structural. I think part of it is, in Flanders, they call it a guiding coalition, so it's not a top-down governance issue. It's about getting the players and the leaders from all different places of the system to come together to, to pitch a vision for the system. And those objectives are the ones that are then played out. So there's a legitimacy and an ownership of the players in the system to, to respond to that. So it's, it's, it's being responsive to national objectives because that's crucial. You can't lose sight of that. You can't just have you know one objective for one group of people and another objective for another. But I guess the question comes down to who establishes those objectives and who is actually setting the, the vision and the strategy for the system. And in both the Netherlands and in Flanders, that's actually a group of, it's not just the government, it's really a group of powerful players whose voices are heard and they work on this together. And I think that they, they have found it useful for buy-in across the system, but also, you know, if you have very different approaches to, to um, to, how, to getting to, to meet your objectives, but everyone's agreed that this is the objective you want to meet, it's a very different conversation than saying you're not meeting this objective that we've set for you because then the player doesn't consider it legitimate. So it's really about placing legitimacy and, and dialogue at the center of, of the process. One of the challenges we've got is a very changing workplace, very changing challenges around skills and so we have to have flexibility around the provision of the type of education that we, do you think that there's there's move, there's room within these, these frameworks for adaptability, maybe around maybe peripatetic teachers, visiting specialists, um, and how do we ensure that if, if, if we need that flexibility, that it's not cut off at the knees by maybe, for example, a local authority deciding to cut the provision around visiting specialists, given that everything's you know, going down to that level? There's anyone who wants to chip in on that. Extremely difficult to uh, you know, anticipate um, what might happen. I mean, you can create worst case scenarios, but uh, I, I think the, the, uh, what, 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 what we need to do is to put in place a mechanism that's try to ensure that we, we, that we do create equity in the system. And the, 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 um, things like the Pupil Equity Fund and so on are all part of a process of trying to even, even out the issues that uh, that uh, go between schools. So, I mean, I, I think, uh, as Tracy says, this is this is difficult. If you move to a to a system where there is more, uh, much greater local autonomy, then you have to to uh, put in place other mechanisms that try to ensure that what you don't do is just widen the gap in in, the, in that in that process. I think that will be one of the questions for the the regional collaboratives because that's at that level. Um, it allows that kind of, of, of varied support to be, uh, be put in place, not just within particularly some of the smaller authorities, but uh, operating more, uh, more generally. But um, I, I think there is such a focus on equity in Scottish education just now uh, that, that uh, I would, my hope would be that, that that will drive good behaviours in this direction rather than, than behaviours that might uh, uh, widen the gap. Final question on, on uh, regional collaboratives. Do you see the regional collaboratives working in a way that might be able to address um, issues around teacher recruitment and, and ensuring that not all local authority or schools are not fighting against one another in order to recruit teachers? Uh, I think the re regional collaboratives provide um, an opportunity to um, provide teachers with um, different types of experiences in diff different contexts and sort of build their um, sort of professional expertise by actually orchestrating the movement of, of the workforce around an area that's greater than the local, local authority. So um, a byproduct of that may be that you can begin to think about how you coordinate the workforce over, over a bit bigger region. So, so I think there is the potential there for that, but probably as a byproduct rather than as an intent, um, a sort of primary objective. Professor Thompson. The, 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 uh, possible benefits from all of this, if it really works well, uh, is that what we do is to create a much more attractive teaching profession and a much more attractive education system. There's a case just now, Joanne Lavin earlier talked about the difficulty in re recruiting head teachers. I mean, I would hope that as we move forward, that instead of head teachers seeing the job as one where you get a bit of extra money, but you get all the, all the flack that, that comes your way, you actually have a much more creative um, role inside a school than, is, is, than some perceive to be the case at the moment. And similarly with, 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 with teachers, I think if we, if we create a context where 
uh, that we're building the teaching profession and building the confidence and capacity of the profession, that the schools are vibrant places, many of them are just now, but more vibrant places than they are just now, I think that's part of how you, you, you combat the perception that teaching is a, is, a, is a difficult job that's not as well paid as it might be and therefore we've got a problem to do with, with recruitment. I, my hope would be that this, this, will, this will help us to create a much more, um, make a much more attraction towards being part of that, of what I hope would be an exciting Scottish education system. Uh, you don't want to come in now, do you? I can ask one supplementary, if I may, just on the point Liz Smith was um, pursuing with, uh, with uh, Professor Donson about uh, autonomy of head teachers, uh, sorry, the accountability of head teachers. Um, is it possible to define who they will actually be accountable to once this exercise has concluded? I mean, is it me as a parent or is it, is it, is it who? There will be multiple accountabilities yeah. in the process. I think that's an inevitability yeah. uh, arising uh, from this. And part of it will have to be to do with transparency. You know, so the nature of, of what's happening inside a school is one that is, is, is very transparent. And then the, those multiple accountabilities can operate in relation to that. I think the inspection process as it moves forward, I think will have an important part to play in helping to create that uh, or support that uh, transparency. But, but there's quite big changes needed for that's going to happen. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bonner. Is it possible to discover who head teachers are accountable to by reading the consultation on the bill? Then the answer is no. Um, there is a great deal in that document which is extraordinarily confused and confusing. I mean, I have said already that I think its direction of travel is broadly correct, but there is a great deal of work requiring to be done if we are going to get a coherent piece of legislation out of it which results in a system where responsibilities and accountabilities are clear because they certainly are not at the present moment. Thank you very much. Uh, George, sorry. George. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, I would like to ask about national priorities. Uh, we received a paper from SPICE which effectively told us about the international comparisons. And unfortunately for us as politicians, there was no silver bullet there to be able to actually say that that's the system to go forward. But that probably means that it's horses for courses, it's basically each nation to their own uh, ideal and what they want to do. But what I'd like to ask is, uh, we have the National Improvement Plan and we have the regional collaboratives. Uh, how do we, what, is, what do you see? Do you see the process that we, the Scottish Government proposed as a good way that we'll be able to get the National Improvement Framework and uh, work with the regional bases to try and make sure that it does what it's meant to do and also at a local level as well? Do you think the framework's there? And if not, then how do we go about making sure we do that? I think I mean, the framework is just a mechanism. Um, uh, the framework won't inspire people or, or, or you know, result in, in itself in anything happening in schools that are dramatically... An hour and a half, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, but I, th I think the, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 the challenge will be, and as, as you made the point earlier, that there is no magic bullet, there's nothing we can take you know, and just policy borrow from wherever it is that we, we can put into it. We need to, this structure has to be true to Scottish, Scottish culture and Scottish education. It's got to work with, and that, with the people that we've, uh, that we've got. Um, uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic this can, be, this, this can work. Uh, but there are huge risks in the in the in the process, uh, uh, and we really need to go into this with eyes open and prepare to take some very hard decisions uh, as it moves forward. Okay. Okay. Uh, can I just ask just yes, one course, very George. quickly? I was more uh, interested in what, based on this, obviously it was uh, Keir Bloomer that brought up the fact that uh, part of the framework is the attainment gap and uh, closing the attainment gap in particular. And I was interested in one of the things you said, uh, Keir, about the fact that uh, it's not so much the money, it's how you use the money. And one of the things that in your paper or what the Royal Society have done has mentioned that SIMD isn't necessarily the, the best way to go forward. Now, I've been in this committee in its various guises over the years to know that I'm aware of its faults but uh, what other ways have we got to try and get the right money into the right place at the right time? Uh, do you have any ideas on that one as well? Well, of course, the Pupil Equity Fund didn't actually use SIMD as a way of allocating the money. It used preschool meal entitlement. Um, 
Free school meal entitlement has drawbacks because not everybody who is entitled takes up the, the free meal. And of course, nowadays, uh, at the lower end of the primary school, in many cases, it's impossible to sort out uh, who is entitled to, to, to free school meals. But it is essentially a measure of individual circumstances, whereas, of course, SIMD is a measure of the circumstances of, of an area and doesn't necessarily say anything uh, about the circumstances of the individual. We know that there are more poor people living in areas out with SIMD 1 and 2 than within it. So it's, it's by no means a precise uh, correlation between disadvantage of the individual and SIMD. I think, I think this is a very complex issue. Um, the Royal Society has responded to the consultation on measuring the uh, attainment gap. Uh, and has come to the conclusion that although uh, the notion of keeping the measures few and simple uh, has a lot to commend it, the complexity of the issues is probably such that that is not an aspiration which can be realised and that we probably have to mix SIMD with other measures, perhaps the free school meal entitlement one, which look at the circumstances of, of the individual. Um, so... I agree with you, the SIMD has got some considerable merits, but on its own it doesn't, doesn't provide a secure basis for this. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, George. John, did you want to go? No. Okay, in that case, can I thank you very much for your attendance today? That was, that was very useful, and that brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting. I will now wait for the gallery to clear. Thank you. <laughs>